Hi, podcast listeners. Stay tuned after the show's closing credits for a new episode of Fulcrum with your host, Stephen with a PH for legal reasons, Bannon. The following podcast contains... Oh, won't somebody please think of the children? Explicit language. Hello and welcome to the podcast that asks a simple question. When you said it's not you, it's me, but you knew it wasn't you all along, what the hell were you thinking? I'm your host, Dave Bledsoe, and this is a Friday, April 7th, 2017, Highway to the Friend Zone edition of the show, where we talk about how platonic relationships between men and women are killing all the white babies in America. Stay tuned. The What the Hell Were You Thinking podcast is brought to you by Emotional Maturity. Are you struggling to define your relationships with the opposite sex, frustrated by your inability to read common social cues, or in despair by your failure to attract a significant other? Try Emotional Maturity. EM guides you through complex processes like dating and relationships by a simple proven method of telling you to grow the fuck up. No longer will you be distracted by juvenile obsessions with the opposite sex or view other human beings through a lens of sexual objectification. Emotional maturity will help you help yourself by not being such a simpering little shit. EM has helped billions of adult human beings enjoy personal relationships with those of different genders by being an adult enough to treat them as an entity with self-determination and not a receptacle for your sexual desire. Use the promo code ADULTING at checkout and get our guide to race relations called It's Empathy, You Fucking Don't, for free. Emotional maturity. No one said growing up is easy. Stop whining about it and just do it. Do you believe that men and women can be just friends? Yes. Yeah, of course. Yes, I do. Yeah. 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 Um, I think <laughs> it'd be hard to do. Yes. I mean, we're all men. I know. So of course we're going to have those feelings, and we can we can be content with just friendship, but and we can be silent regarding those feelings, but we're gonna have them. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no. No. Way. No. Yes. 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 I I don't believe so. No. I guess what I'm saying is no. Okay, good. Backpack girl, Greg, and then Randy. Okay, we'll walk with you. Do you believe men and women can be just friends? Um. Yeah. Yes. It's uh pretty well known that I'm an irascible old bastard who no longer possesses the fire or the passion of my youth. It's possible I've forgotten what it was like to be young. To yearn, to desire, to need. Why are you so old? Hmm. Uh, I never really thought about it, but I guess it's because despite my best efforts as a young man, I haven't died. My being so old naturally colors certain perceptions, and one of those being I actually like women. Not like like women although i i do i do like like women i enjoy doing naughty things with those willing to share naughtiness with me but i like women as equal partners in friendships you know platonically that's impossible ralph wiggum's not the only person who thinks that in fact it seems to me the majority of men under 30 are intellectually incapable of considering women as anything other than a potential romantic partner And I know maybe I'm being generous when I say that because it isn't so much romance that young men see in women. We used you for sex and moved on. This worldview, while pathetic, is understandable because the young men who hold it are pathetic man-children who have not matured yet. But in time, if they're very lucky, they will grow into thinking sentient creatures who do not exist solely as a carrier for their penis and do not look upon women as solely a sheath for said penis. But as the MRA's activists like to say, not all men grow out of this stage. Because I ran across a fellow by the name of Hans Feeney, a 36-year-old Lutheran pastor in Illinois and contributor to the Federalist who penned a truly insightful view on male-female relations this week that he titled, quote, Why Men and Women Can Never Be Just Friends, unquote, which has gone viral mostly on the heels of Vice President Pence's revelations that he will not dine alone with a woman other than his wife because apparently he is so fucking magnetic they will just end up sexing each other in violation of God's law. The God's laws must be applied to all equally. Well, apparently to riff off Napoleon the Pig, some men are more equal than others and all men are far more equal than women. Podcast host good, podcast producer bad, Gavin. Remember those laws.
Pastor Feeney himself is 12 years married with three children and said his article was pinned as a partial satire. Around a 40% satire, he told the Chicago Tribune. And I guess that fits because his YouTube channel, Lutheran Satire, is filled with videos that I guess are about 40% funny to the sort of people who find right-wing Christian ideology funny. If a woman is promiscuous, she is condemned. If a man is promiscuous, he is praised. This double standard is wrong. I agree. That double standard is wrong. And that's why we should that's really- That's why women should also be praised for being promiscuous. Oh. Huh. Gotta say, that is not where I thought you were going with that. I was thinking maybe we should remember that 1 Corinthians 5 and 6 and Romans 1 and 13 apply to men and women equally. What is it with fundies and fucking sock puppets? Seriously, it's just- Two fucking athletic socks with some red shit smeared on there. I do not know why fundamentalist Christians think sock puppets are in any way educational. Spend $20 at the fucking dollar store and get some real fucking puppets. But I suspect that 40% is the ceiling even for those people who find any kind of Christian humor funny. Still, for the remaining 350 million plus Americans who do not find right-wing Christianity, a Christian ideology our preferred form of getting our chuckle on, the article that Pastor Feeney penned was pretty fucking offensive. Let's, uh, let's look at some of the key points. He starts with pointing out that all of us need to start having more babies. Well, not all of us Americans. But you know... Yeah, if you like white people. Because the national birth rate is just fine. I mean, he isn't even a little subtle about this because he uses the title of a real clear politics article about demographic shifts in the country called, quote, the demographic tsunami. But let's not get bogged down in the racist details. Let's move on to the meat of his op-ed because here is a quote from it. Quote, every year, countless young men find themselves trapped in the friend zone a prison where the women place any man they deem worthy of their time, but not their hearts. Being caught in the friend zone is an inarguable drag on fertility rates as a man who spends several years pledging his heart to a woman who will never have his children is also a man who most likely won't procreate with anyone else during that time of incarceration, unquote. So you see, ladies, you're not by not fucking us. You are fucking America by closing off our genetic heritage and dooming the country to a looming brown tide. But wait, there's more! Pastor Feeney goes on to mansplain his way through the piece, pointing out to the poor, simple, double-X creatures how men only hang out with them, putting up with all their emotions and pretending to listen to them and holding back our intestinal gas because we just really want to be in a relationship with you in order to fill you with our genetic inheritance just as God intended. Quote, God designed these virtues to entice men into marriage. The average man will never be content to receive those gifts in a form of companionship that doesn't lead to marriage. This guy has no fucking clue what it's like to be a man because I'll take that gift anytime you want, ladies. So, sorry, I'm going back, going back to his actual thing. Back in quotes now. Quite simply, men can't be at peace just being friends. And there's nothing you can do to change that. Telling him he's like a brother to you won't stop his brain from shouting, Marry that woman and impregnate her now! My brain has never shouted that once in my entire life. When he encounters your femininity. Again, I don't think Pastor Hans Feeney has ever just fucked somebody raw. Just showed up at a bar, picked them up, took them home, strapped them to their bed with chains and... Sorry, sorry. Yeah. I got a little carried away there. He closes this rousing diatribe with a call to action for every woman keeping a man shackled to the wall of his friend's own prison. Oh, that's where I got the bondage theme from. But he says, quote, It's not my fault that your facial symmetry grosses out my ovaries, but it was my fault. This is what the women should be saying to the men. But it was my fault that I got your hopes up by putting you in the friend zone. As restitution, please accept the phone numbers of five girls I know who find you attractive. Stop wasting your time with me and go and hang out with a girl who one day might bear your children, unquote. So you see, ladies, if you're not going to fuck us, could you at least pimp out five of your friends who maybe will? 
I think the important takeaway is that it is in the eyes of the Lord, you as a woman, your value is not in your company, your intellect, your companionship. You are nothing more than a vessel designed by God to conceive, carry, birth, and care for a man's child. You always have been, you always will be. The sooner you get over this crazy idea of being a human being with needs, wants, and free will of your own, the better it will be for all of everyone, mostly men. Now I know some of you might think I'm being unfair to Pastor Hans, who after all was being tongue-in-cheek with his little snickerfest, but I'm not. Head on over to the Federalist and check out some of his other works, like how no woman should ever wear leggings or free tampons undermine the concept of universal human rights. His author page is in the show notes. As I mentioned earlier, this whole thing comes on the heels of a 14-year-old statement by then-governor or congressman who gives a fuck, now Vice President Mike, marginally better than Trump, Pence. And in that statement, he said that he would not eat a meal alone with a woman other than his wife, nor would he attend an event where alcohol is served without his wife. This little guidepost to life stems from something the Reverend Billy Graham once said, a respected counselor to presidents, a notable televangelist, if for no other reason than he never got caught balls deep in a prostitute or impregnating a church secretary. Five News Tonight. Good evening, TV evangelist Jimmy Swaggart is leaving his fate to the Lord and church leaders tonight after confessing that he sinned. Tears filled his eyes as Swaggart took the pulpit in Baton Rouge, Louisiana this morning to beg forgiveness. Channel 5's Tim Herrera reports tonight, Swaggart is stepping down from his powerful TV ministry while the Assembly of God Church investigates him for having an affair with a prostitute. At least as far as we know, I mean, he just could have been really, really circumspect. Graham penned the Modesto Manifesto detailing ways to avoid the sort of things that make you bang Jessica Hahn and use church money to build a water park as part of Bible land. Reverend Jim Baker! Oh yeah, Reverend Jim Baker. Of course, we don't have to call him Reverend anymore. We can just call him Jim. Apparently this fucking guy is back. I saw a news article on fucking Right Wing Watch mention him the other day. How the fuck did he not kill himself? In and of itself, the Graham Rule is a fairly silly thing, and Pence is free to do whatever makes his marriage work. It's none of my concern. I mean, I've eaten any number of meals alone with women friends where we did not wind up fucking on top of the table in the restaurant. One time it did happen. It wasn't because either one of us couldn't control ourselves. It was because that bill was huge, and we couldn't possibly pay it. So we had to think of a handy way to get ourselves thrown out and not do a dine and dash. But... This sort of thinking is what conservatives think about women. Women are not partners, co-workers, superiors, employees, or even friends. They are... It's all about this coos who's a regular fuck machine. Now I'm talking morning, day, night, afternoon. Dick, 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 dick. How many dicks is that? A lot. When Mike Pence says he doesn't want to put himself in a situation where a woman or anyone else can accuse him of impropriety, what he's really saying is that women cannot be trusted not to accuse him of impropriety. He is a powerful man. And the only reason a woman wants to be with a powerful man is either to fuck him or use the idea that she might have fucked him as leverage to get something. Women, in the mind of Pence and conservatives, are manipulative liars who use their bodies to exploit men's inherent weakness. I've been around women for most of my life, and at times, I was even in positions of authority and power. And never, not once, did any woman, A, try to fuck me, or B, accuse me of trying to fuck them in order to manipulate me or ruin my life and or career. There were times when I was a cop when it was the right thing to do to have another witness around when I was interacting with a woman, but that wasn't to imply she was going to do or had done anything improper or that I could not be trusted, but only only to either make her more comfortable or to provide a witness for legal reasons. I mean, I don't know, maybe I just wasn't hot enough, powerful enough to make trying to fuck me or accuse me of trying to fuck her worth her while. I kind of get men who live through second wave feminism. They're now in their 60s and 70s. One minute they were comfortably ensconced at the top of the world. They could grab women by the pussy with impunity, even if they weren't stars. 
They enjoyed utter freedom to say and do anything they pleased. They benefited exclusively from a system designed by men for men in a society where men were the economic and social force that drove the entire world. And then one day, after centuries of being king shit of Turd Hill, a bunch of uppity women came along and started telling them what they could say and do and demanding that they, the women, be in control of who grabbed their pussies like they were God. Goddamn human beings or something. I get it. I get that. Change is hard. And these men are old and they're going to die soon. Not soon enough, but soon. Expecting them to move on with the times is not entirely rational. It doesn't make them less of an asshole, but you kind of have to expect it just a little bit. The problem is every moment has a backlash. Backlashes can be big or small. I mean, I guess white women are lucky in some respects. After all, we didn't see a lot of white feminist women dangling from southern trees in response to first or second wave feminism. But conservatives, big C and small C, did and do push back. And where and this is where some of this line of thinking comes from. As we march forward into third wave feminism, a major counter argument is the portrayal of women as evil manipulators of innocent men, and it threads through so much thinking, both among the political class and the pathetic neckbeards who populate the lower strata of the internet, like cockroaches underneath the studio beer fridge. Aren't you fucking cockroach? Wonder if it might have something to do with all the Mountain Dew cans, Gavin. Just thinking is all. It pulses in locker rooms and dugouts of sports and the barracks of military bases. See episode 102. It even lurks behind the innocent faces of woke, young, liberal men who see a chance to snag a little pussy by observing the forms of feminism without actually adopting any of the actual principles or ideals. Hey, can I ask you a question since we both love Hillary? Yeah, sure. Would you want to look at my balls? Ew, no. Bitch. What? Bitch. What? Please. No. But it's not fair. Why? Because men are pieces of shit will basically do anything to get laid. Duh. But also because men are fucking pussies, scared little boys who still yearn for mommy, but in a totally edible kind of way, if you know what I mean. Just got a minor edible complex. I've said before that in my own youth, I was not an admirable human being vis-a-vis the women's. I believed in the friend zone the way a Baptist believes in Jesus. I was a nice guy. I wasn't all about trying to fuck every woman I met, although I absolutely was. I treated women as like they were special. I showered them with attention. And my reward was to suffer in silence, seething internally while they fucked other dudes. Because you waited too long to make your move and now you're in the friend zone. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not in the zone. Oh, Ross, you're mayor of the zone. <laughs> <laughs> I was a douchebag, just like Ross. The more times that happened, the angrier I would get. The more I would resent the woman whose affections I desired, but never actually mentioned that I desired, and the angrier I would get. The more I would repress my desires, the more I would overcompensate by what I perceived as niceness, until finally I would blow up and cause some huge fucking fight with the woman I was too scared to admit that I liked, thus ending the illusion of our friendship. And if you believe the black heart of the internet, if you believe Pastor Feeney, I was the victim of a cruel hoax perpetrated by women who only want to use guys like me as an emotional tampon. That was an actual phrase that I employed frequently. I was just somebody that could be used and discarded whenever needed. Because he's kind of a dick, right? Right? I was a late bloomer. I didn't lose my virginity until I was almost 20. I'd been fat and introverted most of my childhood. And worse, I moved constantly, so I never had a core group of friends who turned into romances as we grew up together. I didn't date in high school. I'm fairly certain my parents were worried that I was gay. Fuck me, I am fairly certain my parents still think I'm gay. I was shy and awkward around girls, filled with notions of romantic chivalry from way, way too many fantasy novels. Have the internet existed in its present form in the late 1980s? I would have been the sort of raging prick 
you find ranting incoherently into a camera on YouTube about red pills, a fervent occupant of the manosphere, and a genuine goddamn men's rights activist right down to the neck beard and the fedora. And you might think this is the absolute bottom of where a guy can be. Trust me, it's not. Because I found another rock layer and I dug a little deeper. When I decided I would no longer be an emotional tampon, I decided I would be the one to fuck and run and not in the coolest fairway. I spent a year working out running. I got myself a nice red Mustang and became what today people would call a pickup artist in all the douchey connotations that that comes with. Not like the 80s cool, you know... Jack Tripper or Larry, the guy who lived downstairs pickup artist. I took on all the listening tools I'd learned from life in the friend zone and turned them on on emotionally damaged young women because I discovered they would, in fact, fuck me. Because you are the worst people here. In this iteration of Douchebag Dave, I got laid a lot by preying off women coming off of breakups or ones with emotional issues or hell, even mental health problems because crazy in the head was good in the bed. Trust me when I say I was exactly the kind of prick you're imagining right now, but somehow worse. And I never devolved to the date rapey kind of dude most pickup artists eventually arrive at, only because underneath all of my dickishness, I had some sort of latent sense of morality. So what happened to me? I grew the fuck up. Didn't happen over the night. I had relapses from time to time. I met some strong women who saw something in me worth being friends with. But more than anything else, I grew the fuck up. Time plus experience plus education equals maturity. If I can do it to grow from the depths of douche to a more or less decent human being using this formula, why can't Pastor Feeney, who objectively appears to be more mature than I am, what with his church, his wife, and his kids? Why can't he do it? Why does he have a juvenile YouTube channel where he mansplains his way to misogyny all in the name of Jesus? Why does Mike Pence fear getting a taco with a woman not his wife? Why does the GOP work so hard to make sure women are barefoot and pregnant? Why does Trump and his ilk all seem to be hell-bent on rolling back 30 years or 40 years or 50 years of progress in women's rights? Well, part of it is they are the asshole of an asshole's asshole. But mostly, it's because it's a matter of power and control. Women are now the majority of the population in this country. They're also the majority of college graduates. Women are poised to take the lead in where the country is heading socially, politically, and economically. Not today, not tomorrow, but within the next decade or two. When that happens, the kind of shit men have practiced all these centuries will not be tolerated. Guys like Bill O'Reilly ain't going to get his sexual harassment claims paid off by the network no more. Those kind of fuckers, maybe even Bill O'Reilly, will be fired and then sued into fucking oblivion. Dudes who grab pussies aren't going to live in the White House. They're going to live in jail cells exactly where they belong. The entire predicate of a male-dominated economy and society rests entirely on keeping women from recognizing their position of power and influence. And to do that, you've got to indoctrinate young men with your ideology of male dominance, a patriarchy, for lack of a better word, that explains exactly what the fuck your philosophy is. And you know what? It might be working. The New York Times published an article about the latest results in a study going back 40 years of high school seniors. From the start of the study in 1977 through 1994, views of equality in relationships rose steadily only to plateau and fall ever since. In 1994, only 42% of high school age young men thought that a man should work and a woman should stay home and that was the deal they were going to get. Only 30% of young high school age men in 1994 thought that the man should make all the decisions in a relationship. In 2014, 58% of those young men thought women should stay home and 40% thought that men should make all the decisions. How? How did that happen? You do that. 
by shaping the thoughts of young men on the fringes of society and working inward. The angry, the disaffected, who feel unfairly denied of what those that came before them possessed. You do that by sculpting a narrative where the blame for why things are is laid squarely on the shoulders of a villain, different than the people you are trying to sway. You construct a false premise around the idea that said villain is being unfairly given privileges you cannot access. You lie. You exaggerate. You demonize until the stupid, the uninformed, and the mentally ill rally behind you and elevate you to power. And then... With those people behind you, you start to convince the like-minded among the mainstream that you must be on to something because look at all these people who support you. Sound familiar? It should. It's exactly what Trump did to get elected. And it's all part of the long game of conservatives to hold power exactly where it's always been. The desperate gambit to maintain the status quo for as long as possible before the cultural and economic and political irrelevance that is coming finally overtakes them. And if it were just a political move, it would be bad enough. But the side effects, and I'm being generous here in calling them side effects, are getting women hurt, and killed. I'm not just talking about people like Elliot Roger, the Manosphere mass murderer from Santa Barbara back in 2014, or even the constant harassment of women online by the toads and trolls of the web. I'm talking about day-to-day, life-to-life, of a domestic abuse quietly condoned or even endorsed by right-wing religion, like <laughs> religionists like Pastor Hans Feeney. Does the name Duggar ring any bells? I'm talking about the idea of a rape culture, a name that makes men squirm, even me, but it exists throughout our culture. Hey, does the name Brock Turner ring any bells? The innocent-sounding friend zone that we use as a joke, a meme, is instrumental in getting young men used to the idea that they own women, that women are subservient to men. It codifies millennia of traditional gender roles and stereotypes in order to preserve a system of dominance and submission, and not the cool kind with leather and whips, but the one that keeps the social order and maintains it with men on top. It turns romantic relationships into a vehicle of power dynamics rather than partnerships based on mutual respect and affection. It makes love a weapon. And I'm probably not the right person to pontificate on the nature of love. I never got married. Came close a time or two, but never actually did it. But two women in my life that I could not love more if they were my spouse. Our relationships are based on support. Love, mutual understanding, and a deep respect for one another. It's not romantic love, whatever the fuck that is, and they're not sexual. The bullshit line that men and women cannot be friends or that these women are using me for emotional support is belied by the existence of our actual friendship. And since both of them are in long-term committed relationships with other people who know and accept that our friendships exist, the idea that marriage, romance, and love between two people excludes all other relationships is also bullshit. And we, the three of us, are not highly enlightened beings, and we are also not unaware of our mutual sexualities. It's come up, but we've dealt with it like adults. Our friendship is not about who holds power in the relationship. It's based on us liking one another. Love is not a weapon in our lives. So when I hear about friend zones or how about men and women can never be friends because they're just going to know want to fuck each other, I don't know. I know it's a lie fabricated on an artificial divide. Sometimes intelligent, mature adults occasionally do experience the desire to fuck And sometimes they might even want to fuck their friends. You just don't do it. How hard is that? I mean, if you're married, sometimes you might want to fuck your spouse right there on the restaurant table. But you just don't do it. Unless, of course, you know, your bill is really, really huge and you can't afford to pay for it. Then you guys should totally fuck on that restaurant table because they will throw you out and never once ask about what you owe. (laughs) That is it for our show this week. You know, it's important to us that you understand that while we love you, we don't love, love you. And we don't want you to think or get any ideas about the nature of our relationship. We are a podcast, and you, 
while we care about you deeply, are a listener. And we don't see that ever really changing. It's not you. It's Gavin, you see. He's intensely jealous, and we don't want him getting the wrong idea. No one else but you, buddy. Never leave you for anyone else. No one could do your job. If anyone else out there knows anyone who wants to be a podcast producer, give us a call because we're totally willing to break up with Gavin. We do want to ask, however, if you know any other hot listeners, not that you're not beautiful, who might be into hooking up with us. You know, people who are into some stuff like poly podcastery, who like to have multiple podcasts. We know that's not your thing, but we respect that. It's just, you know, you could rate and review the show on iTunes so that other folks who like to swing like we do could find us if they were into that. You can always hang with us on Twitter at the Hell underscore podcast or the show name on Facebook. If you ever need to hear our voice to remind you of the good times, you can find all the shows at the show name on SoundCloud and at www.whatthehellpodcast.com. For me, Dave Bledsoe and producer, I don't even think of as a friend, Gavin, and all the other fictional polys on this show. We want to say we've been around for such a long, long time. And that's why it pissed me off so much when you drank all my wine. We'll see you all next week. Welcome to Fulgrim, Balancing the Scales, with your host, Stephen with a PH for legal reasons, Ben. Oh, I'm telling you, man, my asshole is redder than rouge on a Thai hooker. I ate some fucking foreign food on Monday, and I've been on and off the shitter more times than a priest on a new altar boy. Ah. Oh. Fuck me, if it weren't for three bottles of Doors and 18 Percocets a day, I wouldn't get anything done. Do you see what that little shit Kushner did this week? Got me booted off the National Security Council. Who the fuck does that little cuck think he is? Just because that little heeb is fucking Don's daughter, he thinks he can take on me? I'm the fucking president of the United States. He keeps messing with me. I'm going to turn the frogs loose on his ass. Ah, ah I don't want to say exactly what's going to happen. But let me just insinuate it's going to get hotter than a duck cow oven if he don't back off. I mean, I built this motherfucking White House. If anyone's going to run this place, it's going to be me. See what happens, Kushner, you miserable little Hi. This has been Falker, Balance in the Scale, an objective look at right-wing perspectives, hosted by Stephen, the PH, for legal reasons, man.